This is video two of the, uh, of the brain and cranial nerves, chapter 13. Uh, this will be a shorter video, I hope. Uh, I'm gonna, this is the cerebrum that we talked about in the last video for half an hour. Then we're gonna talk now about the, the, these other parts of the brain. The, uh, the diencephalon is this part in blue here. And the diencephalon consists of three parts. This epithalamus back here, kind of in this region, and that includes this little gland called the pineal gland, which I'll talk about. The thalamus, which is kind of the middle. By the way, this whole thing kind of surrounds the third ventricle. If you were to pick up the ventricles by that third ventricle, you'd be basically grabbing it by the, by the diencephalon. Thalamus is this main mid-bit here, and then the hypothalamus is kind of this little protrusion in front. Hypothalamus, as you remember from the endocrine system, connects, oh, that's in a different uh, class. As you will learn in the endocrine system, that connects to the uh, pituitary gland and it's a really major hormonal control uh, uh, region. Then we're gonna move on to the brain stem, which is this part in green, which consists of the midbrain here, kind of at the top, and you can see a central, uh, sorry, cerebral aqueduct coming through here, connecting the, uh, the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. Uh, and midbrain, pons, this football shaped thing, and then the medulla oblongata, which is continuous with the spinal cord. These I'll give you more detail on in a minute. I'm just kind of showing you where they are. Here's the cerebrum back here. And this is one thing I said looks like it was added on later because it doesn't quite match. You don't have to be able to identify those things in the lecture. I'm not gonna give you a lecture quiz and have you spot them on a map, but just you're gonna have to know what they do. And you may have to spot them on a map in lab. So the limbic system, I'm gonna go through these, through these slides here because you can put them in reference. So, Here's those three regions I was talking about. The limbic system that I'll talk about later kind of surrounds that, uh, that diencephalon, sort of, and it consists of parts that extend into the cerebrum and so on. Then the reticular formation consists largely of the uh, brainstem, parts of the diencephalon, and then nerves that go out to the cerebrum. All right, so let's move on to these parts and we'll talk about them. <coughs> Now these, I'm gonna say, I've gotten some real short bullet points after these uh, structures, so you're gonna have to, again, take notes. Maybe pause after each one and make sure you get everything written down. The thalamus, which was that middle part of the diencephalon, is kind of an editing and sorting region. It uh, tells you what you think is pleasant or unpleasant, so if you have uh, an opinion about a taste or a you don't like color, you know, clothes of a certain color or whatever. These are kind of partially, partially dictated by the thalamus. But it also um, takes, it, as we'll see later when we talk about the reticular formation, it's, it's gonna get rid of a lot of stimuli that you don't think are important. So though when I talked in the previous video about I, can, I know that that periodic table's up there on the wall, I still know it's there, but I don't care. I don't have to think about it all the time. That, image of it's coming in, the thalamus kind of eliminates that for me. Hypothalamus is kind of a homeostatic and endocrine region. As I said, it's connected to the pituitary, and the pituitary produces or stores like eight plus hormones. So the hypothalamus kind of dictates the release and manufacture of those hormones, in addition to controlling some of your basic, uh, basic um, homeostatic uh, functions like uh, your autonomic nervous system and uh, body temperature regulation and hunger and various other things. The epithalamus is really important when it deter in determining your uh, sleep-wake cycle. Uh, you basically sleep, what, eight hours a night and then wake up for the other 16 and repeat. And we generally sleep at night um, interestingly, because we are, well, we're called diurnal creatures, which means we're active during the day. <clears throat> and we sleep at night. There's lots of nocturnal creatures that sleep at night, uh, sleep during the day and are awake at night. But you wonder why we do that? And oftentimes people would say, uh, it's because we can't see at night. Well, you can see okay, right? But the thing is you can't see as good as some things that you don't want to meet at night. So you don't like, we don't want to meet a leopard. Evolutionarily speaking, Leopards uh, would be a significant danger. We don't want to meet, you know, a cliff edge. <laughs> they can't see at night. But um, we're basically safer if we're not out and active at nighttime. So we, we move around during the day. And the, this pineal gland 
that's associated with your epithalamus um, produces melatonin, which is a uh, hormone that makes you sleepy. I'm not sure if it works, nobody's sure if it works in the pills, but if it works for you, go knock yourself out, literally. Um, interestingly, your epithalamus also uh, reacts to, or help, lets you react to odor. So not just like detecting an odor, which is obviously your olfactory region, but like, ugh, you know, like barf smell, right? That's a bad odor, that makes you feel bad. Uh, you know, feces, rotting organisms, stuff like that. Or on the flip side, um, ice cream or something, you know, that smells really good, pizza. You're probably gonna have a more enthusiastic response to that. All right, let's move down to the brain stem, which was that uh, sort of shaft that runs, connects to your spinal cord. The midbrain's that upper portion. You can see some, some attributes here, fight and flight response, uh, pain suppression, and, and visual and startle reflexes. You might think, well, those don't seem all that connected, but uh, your sympathetic nervous system gets you ready for high energy activities, which uh, might end up having you experience some pain, right? So if you're gonna, def that's what they call it, fight or flight. If you have to fight something or struggle to survive, you're gonna maybe get some pain, but you need to be able to think through that stuff. So when you're playing a sport, if you've ever been, like I play rugby, I wouldn't want to just jump on the ground right here because I'd feel like it would hurt. But if my sympathetic nervous system was all amped up, you'd get thrown on the ground quite a bit, but it doesn't really hurt. It's a pretty nice, neat little trick. Now the visual and startle reflexes are, uh, it's better when we're in person in this one because what I do is I take, I say, I'm gonna ex show you guys your visual uh, reflex, all right? You guys, it might work here, here we go. I bet that you watched that ball fly up in the air, right? Because you were, it's a reflex. You're, we're reflexively prone to look towards things that are moving in our field of view, right? It's a, it's a uh, survival uh, mechanism. Same thing with the startle reflex, and it doesn't work at all here, but if you were all in class and I went and made a loud clap noise, those of you that were on your phone would kind of jerk and look up at me because it helps you survive if you respond to the loud things nearby, <laughs> right? Or uh, loud things that are moving towards you. Those are good things to respond to. Uh, the pons is a relay center, so lots of information is going to be transferred to the higher brain regions through the pons, but it's also oddly uh, involved in some strange things like rhythmic breathing. Uh, if you're sitting there not thinking about your breathing, the pons is controlling that. And then your medulla oblongata, which uh, in addition to, I can't remember the joke from uh, Waterboy now, but Something about Colonel Sanders and alligators being so angry because they got so many teeth and no toothbrush. In any case, um, this is an autonomic nervous system uh, controlling region, cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, peristalsis, and swallowing are controlled through there. All right, let's move to the cerebellum, which is, like I said, that it's that little add-on in the back of your brain. Uh, it is a, it helps you move, so it's a motor region, but it doesn't direct, it doesn't make you move. So remember that primary motor cortex, that's what's going to generate those movements. So I can, I can grab, I can move my arms in certain ways, and I can, you know, pick up my leg and stuff. But in order to make all that stuff smooth, you're going to need the, you're going to need both that premotor cortex and you're going to need the cerebellum. So this trick that I did with the pen, with this stick, uh, obviously involves my cerebellum to get it to work uh, smoothly. And so does juggling. So I'm gonna juggle embryos for you. That's more for shock value. If you remember these, these are two-celled, four-celled, and eight-celled stages of an embryo. So juggling this, it's not, it's not hard for somebody to go like this. Probably, I hope, right? So if you can throw a ball, you can probably catch the ball and not make it look too terrible. Although. You'll see some people do that. But to take, say, two balls, it's gonna, or two embryos, it's gonna be a little bit harder. Now what's happening here is that I'm not looking at my hands, right? And I'm, I basically am using a lot of different systems to, to accomplish this task. And then with three balls, or three embryos, it's gonna be a little trickier, but not tricky if you've done it. So your, your prefrontal cortex and your cerebellum are all involved in smoothing out that behavior. If I was not, if my cerebellum was damaged, it would probably look more like 
right? And it would just be a failure. And that embryo is gone. All right, moving on. The limbic system. So I've got the limbic system and reticular formation here kind of crammed together, but the limbic system's grouped in here. Uh, it's, I say multi regional, meaning it's not in one lobe or it's not in one specific limited location. It's kind of spread out. Uh, it involves emotions, psychosomatic effects. I said effects because it's not just illness, but <clears throat> if, for instance, uh, if you see somebody throw up, uh, Lots of you are probably going to feel ill after that. Um, some people will, and there's a famous scene in Stand By Me where uh, they had this somebody, they gave somebody something to make them barf, but then everybody started barfing just because it was gross. So it's a big barfarama. Uh, but if you're, we're social creatures, and if one of your group starts vomiting, you feel sick because as you know, social creatures, there's a good chance, at least evolutionarily speaking, that you probably ate the same thing as this guy, right? So inducing yourself to vomit, causing yourself basically un subconsciously to feel sick and vomit is probably a, uh, you know, a, an ad adaptive response. Uh, but it's not just illness. You can convince, you know, the placebo effect basically is this. So if you are given a pill that says this is a pain reliever and you don't feel pain after that, even though it was just a nothing starch, uh, that's this, that's involving your limbic system. Uh, emotional uh, connections to memories. So uh, when, you, when you remember a time in your life that you liked or didn't like, you're gonna, you're gonna feel an emotion and that's generated here. And interestingly, uh, memories of odors are, if you've ever been some, you know, been walking along and all of a sudden you get an odor, you smell something that you, that takes you back and you almost are in that spot that you were in 10 years ago. Like, like I was walking down a street one day a couple weeks ago and I got a smell and I was like, it smelled, it smelled, didn't smell like Seoul, South Korea, but something in that odor reminded me of some part or some restaurant or some place in South Korea that I, I was just suddenly, I could picture the buildings. It was really weird, but you guys probably all experienced that. Uh, the reticular formation is again kind of another multi-regional area, but it's mostly brainstem and diencephalon, and this is a big filtering re uh, region of the brain. Let uh, me say here that it filters out about 99% of the stimuli out. What I want you to just picture sitting in your room or wherever you're watching this video right now, hopefully you're focused on this lecture. Hopefully you're not focused on the million things in your room that you could pay attention to very easily, right? Uh, the sound of maybe your air conditioner coming on, the, uh, the activity in the kitchen, your cat or your dog walking through the area, whatever, the radio, any, any number of things that could be distracting, you hopefully are filtering out so that you're, you're focused on the task at hand. People with um, attention uh, deficit disorders, now, I can't tell you for sure all of them, but I, I would make a good bet that uh, lots of it has to do with improper functioning of this reticular formation. Uh, alertness and consciousness, they're sort of on the same continuum there. If you're alert, that's when you're like shh, totally focused. At conscious, you're just you know awake and kind of aware of your surroundings and that spectrum all the way through. So this reticular formation really activates when you wake up. All right, now this, uh, this chapter, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there on memories and, and uh, language and uh, other stuff that I, we just don't have time for. So I'm gonna jump right to cranial nerves. And here I've written a list of the cranial nerves in order. Uh, you'll have to spot a bunch of them in lab and on a model. But in lecture, all I want you to do is know name, number, and basic function. So here they are in order from one to 12. Uh, I'll pronounce them for you. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibulocochlear, that's a mouthful, glossopharyngeal, that's a mouthful, and that's a pun. Uh, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal. <clears throat> now here's the mnemonic. This is sort of a memory device that you can use to, to remember it. Now there's lots out there uh, type in uh, cranial nerve mnemonics 
and uh, take your safe search off if you want to find some risque ones. But this one's straight up and it rhymes, so this is one I remembered. On old Olympus's towering tops, a friendly Viking grew vines and hops. You can remember that. You can remember the first letter of each of those. Knowing what they do requires another mnemonic. Now, it doesn't go into detail, but S stands for sensory, M stands for motor, and B stands for both. So some say marry money. But my brother says big brains matter more. When I remembered it, it wasn't brains. So knock yourselves out. And then just to show you, we've got one more photograph of one more image here to show you that that kind of summarizes two of those things. It doesn't give you the, the Viking story, but it does tell you the, the nerves in order by number, sensory, motor, or both, and a basic function. So this is about all, this basic function over here is good enough for me for, for, for a lecture, okay? There's a lot more detail involved there, but um, if you know that it's, uh, if it's a cranial nerve number five, uh, that it's the trigeminal because you've figured out that, that mnemonic, and it says face sensation and chewing, mastication. So sensory and motor, right? So both. Chapter 13's in the bag. Thank you.